the old house was dark and quiet when I pulled up out front. The glowing red Luigi's Pizza sign on top of my car was the only light in the area, aside from a few flickering blue street lamps, mingling to cast the road in an eerie flashing crimson and purple glow. This section of town was ancient, full of century old houses, and this place was no exception. It looked like it had been built before World War II, with shutters on the windows and a porch with broad columns out front. I pulled over to the side of the road, parking up against the curb, rather than using the driveway. My shitbox car leaked oil, and I'd gotten in trouble once after leaving a small black puddle of crude in some rich guy's parking space. Whoever lived in this place looked wealthy, and I didn't want to piss them off. When you're a delivery driver like me, you'll do anything to improve your chances of a proper tip. Some nights, those are few and far between. When I rang the doorbell, a voice answered through the intercom, sounding like an elderly British gentleman. Hello? The voice said. Hey, Luigi's Pizza, I've got your pie. No sauce, half beef. Oh, perfect, the man replied. I'm not able to come down right now. I live on the second floor. Would you be able to bring it up to my apartment? I would really appreciate it. Sure, I said, smiling a little. Appreciated was code for money in my line of work. There was a buzzing noise like you'd hear at any apartment door when someone let you in, and I turned the knob to go inside. Stairs greeted me immediately, leading straight up. There was no door to access the first floor, which I found a little odd. Unpainted drywall surrounded me, which appeared new, and I could smell fresh sawdust, as if there had been recent construction here. I climbed the stairs, and when I reached the top, I found a hallway leading towards a single white door. Goosebumps ran up my spine as I looked at that door and saw it was open just a crack, but it was dark inside. With a brief, worried pause, I pushed the door open and stepped inside. Hello? I called out, expecting the old man to flick on a light and be standing there in front of me, waiting for me in the darkness, waiting for a meal. But instead, there was nothing but silence. Maybe this was the wrong apartment, I thought to myself, but there had been no other doors except for this one, unless I had missed it. I prepared to leave when the door slammed shut behind me, so fast and so hard that it sent a huge gust of wind through the room, rustling unseen papers and making the hairs on the back of my neck stand on end. My heart was a pounding drum in my chest as I spun around and tried to feel for the door handle, but there was nothing to be found, only a perfectly smooth wall and nothing else. A spider fell down from the ceiling and crawled down my shirt collar, and then another, and another, as I brushed them off with trembling hands. I felt their fat bodies squirming away from my fingers and skittering across my scalp. I began to scream for help, dropping the pizza on the floor and desperately searching for the walls for a light switch in the darkness, groping my hands over the walls as I hyperventilated, yelling and begging for someone to let me out of this place, but ow! It felt like something had cut my hand. A razor blade? A jagged piece of glass jutting out of the wall? Whatever it was, it had been sharp enough to break skin, and it had cut me deep. Warm blood trickled down my arm, and I began to whimper from the pain, imagining the gash going to the bone with no way to see it to reassure myself otherwise. Spiders continued to rain down on me from above, as if the ceiling were a storm raining arachnids. Terror came over me in a wave as I realized that this was no accident. Someone had lured me up here intentionally, and they wanted to torture me. My throat felt tight, and my knees buckled as I shrank to the floor, clutching my knees to my chest. Having fun yet? A voice asked from the walls. The same kind, elderly British man who had greeted me at the door was speaking from all around me. I screamed something unintelligible, begging him to let me out. He answered with a cackling bout of laughter, which devolved into a hacking cough. All my life I wanted to do this, but I was always worried about getting caught, he said, his voice giddy and giggling. But since my diagnosis, lung cancer, stage four, I don't have to worry about prison anymore. I've only got a few more months to live, they tell me, and now I can do all the things I've always dreamed of. 
No more unfulfilled plans and lost wishes. What's the point of money anyways? You can't take it with you after all. Best to spend it on the things you enjoy. The things that make you happy. That was when I realized this man was truly insane. A psychopath who got his entertainment from other people's suffering and pain. Why else would he trap me in a room sabotaged with razor blades and raining giant spiders? I got up and pressed deeper into the room, unsure how I was going to get out, but knowing I couldn't go back the way I'd entered. The door behind me was gone, and the walls were covered with sharp objects meant to injure me if I went searching for a way out. I heard the sound of spinning electric saws turning on, their whirring blades sending sparks flying. I made the mistake of reaching out to check for a wall and got hit by a spinning blade. The only option was to go forward, it seemed. You're insane, I muttered, ripping my t-shirt into strips and wrapping my hands with the fabric. What kind of person enjoys doing this to another human being? Just let me out of here. My boss will figure out I'm missing soon. They'll send the cops for me. You want to spend your last days in jail? The man began to laugh again until it turned into that horrible, hacking cough. I heard him spit up a gob of something which was likely blood before speaking again. Don't worry about me. If that, had, if that happens to me, you should be glad. I see you're pressing forward, young man. Good, very good. Be careful, though. I, I, I have more surprises for you. With my next step, I felt the floor give way, dropping out from underneath me. I plunged down sickeningly into darkness, my stomach lurching upwards and trailing after me a moment later, threatening to eject the contents from inside. And then I was falling, hurtling downwards into darkness so deep I couldn't see my own hand in front of my face. I hit the cement floor hard enough to rattle my teeth in their sockets, spiking my tailbone and sending a lightning bolt of pain up my spine. It was dark in this new place, musty and wet like a basement. Things were scurrying around nearby, making rustling, nibbling noises like rats and mice. Before I could open my mouth to scream for help, I heard someone else do just that. Please, let me out of here, you maniac. I have a family. Hello? I began to say, but another voice cut me off. Help, help, help. It was a woman, and she repeated the word over and over again not stopping for several minutes. It sounded as if she had gone completely mad. I just got here, I managed to say when she was done. How long have you all been down here for? Several dozen voices began to answer, their responses horrifying me. They were all behind walls, as if this were a dungeon or a maze, a dark labyrinth of horrors. A month, said one trembling old man's voice. A week, said the small timid voice of a young girl. And then finally, a woman spoke. The one who had been yelling help over and over again. I'm his wife, she said, then broke into a titter of insane laughter. <laughs> I've been down here for three years, and you're all gonna die down here. Working for a residential property management firm is about as glamorous as it sounds. It's a decent living, but most of the tenants can drive you batshit crazy, especially at Martin Place. About half pay their rent late if they pay it at all. Eviction court takes up most of my time. Whenever I'm not booting out a squatter, I'm doing small repairs in the apartments. No one else in the office would take the place, so I got stuck with it. I can honestly say I never had a tenant I liked there except for Doug Albertson. He was decent, in the beginning anyway. In the end, he was the most abominable person I'd ever met. Doug moved into apartment six, normal seeming fella, mid forties, no kids, work from home job. Behavior modification, he said. I meet with people over video chat to help them break their bad habits. Smoking, cursing, nail biting, you name it and I can put a stop to it. He had his groceries delivered and took only his trash out at night. Nice, but reclusive. The guy never called for any kind of maintenance. The most communication I had with him was the day I showed him the place. You'd see him now and again in the hall, but that was it. The rest of the building was chaos. 
nonstop parties, drunks stumbling down the hallway, and druggies passed out on the stairs. Most of these miscreants were guests of Toby Hansen in apartment seven. He raised hell all day. I was walking down the stairs on a cold afternoon when I had one of my rare Doug sightings. He was walking up the steps with his mail. We waved to each other and mumbled hellos as we passed by. Excuse me, Doug called out from the top of the stairs. May I speak with you for a moment? Sure, I replied. What you need, Doug? He smiled uncomfortably and kicked his toe on the ground. You could tell he was uncomfortable. I looked at my watch to give him the silent, hurry the hell up signal so we'd move things along. The gentleman in apartment seven keeps late hours, he said very politely, very noisy. Do you think you could talk to him for me? Sorry, Doug, I responded. I've talked to Toby Hansen about a dozen times, telling him to keep that racket down. Son of a bitch ignores me. Can't evict him for being a turd. Kid pays his rent. Your best bet is to call the cops with a noise complaint. If the boy gets enough fines, maybe he'll shut up. I would rather avoid involving the police, he said dryly. Perhaps I can help him modify his behavior. Thank you for your help. We said goodbye and went about our business. That was the last complaint I ever received about Toby Hansen. Suddenly, he became a model tenant. His rent was always in the drop box on time. I figured he must have gotten a job because he was never home when I was in the building. All of his no good friends vanished. The parties came to an end. It didn't fix the other 10 piss poor tenants, but it went a long way toward quieting the place down. Over the next few months, oddly enough, the apartment building started quieting down a great deal. The couple in apartment three stopped their round the clock bickering and yelling sessions. For as long as I could remember, You'd always hear them shouting at each other anytime you were in the building, shattering plates, clothes being thrown out the window, arguments in the hallway. One day, they were just quiet. I'd get a maintenance request every other month or so from them, which I'd take care of while they were at work. Otherwise, not a peep. I popped by the building on the second of the month to check the rent box and was surprised to see Doug again. He lived on the second floor but I could swear he was coming out of apartment five, Joe Kimbler's place. He was a violent alcoholic with an impressive rap sheet. Didn't seem like Doug's kind of company, but who's to judge? Morning, Doug, I shouted and tossed my hand in the air in his direction. The building was as quiet as a tomb, a welcome, if not unusual change. This may be the most peaceful I've ever heard this place. Doug smiled and waved in return. It's all about behavior modification, sir, he replied as he started up the steps. Your suggestion worked. I spoke with Mr. Hansen as well as the other residents. It seems my skills were able to help them work through some of their issues. Have a good day. You too, Doug, I shouted back to him. He vanished into his apartment. My job had become manageable, enjoyable even. That was until August of this year when half of the rent checks from the building bounced. I called the tenants multiple times, but not a single one of them answered. Probably left three dozen voicemails. Hell, a hundred text messages. Emails, not that anyone checks the damn things anymore. No answer. I was shocked to see Doug's name on the list of bounced checks. After a few days and no returned calls, I headed over to the building and started knocking on doors. No one on the first floor answered. They weren't a likely bunch to maintain regular employment, so I figured a few of them were dodging me. I headed up the stairs and knocked on Doug's door. No answer. I hammered harder calling his name, but still no response. Just as I was turning to walk down the stairs into the car, I heard a muffled noise inside. I called his name a few times, but no answer. Just those muffled cries. Reaching into my pocket, I pulled out my key ring and slid the master key into the lock. As I pushed the door inward, an overwhelming smell washed over me. Ammonia and rotting food, maybe. Smelled like a damn kennel. Doug? I shouted. You here? You okay? 
No answer other than a muffled voice coming from his bedroom. Concerned he may be hurt, I headed for the door and opened it. The stench intensified so badly that my eyes began to water. Suddenly the room was filled with a chorus of muffled moans and sobs. Along the walls of the bedroom were dog cages. Inside each one was one of the building tenants. Their ankles and wrists were tethered together, dirty rags in their mouths, and shock collars around their necks. On a table in the center of the room sat a single sheet of paper. I picked it up and read the brief script. I apologize for the bad check, sir. Some things cannot be avoided. I won't be returning. But as a thank you for the wonderful accommodations, I have completed my behavior modification sessions with your tenants. They shall trouble you no longer. Yours respectfully, Doug Albertson. No one knew where the storm had come from, but it was the worst any of us had ever seen. The floor tilted sickeningly each time we drifted up or crashed down one of the massive North Atlantic waves. They were high enough to break across the 30 meter tall bow of our cargo ship. And at night, the waves always seem even bigger. Beyond the glow of the ship lights, the dark distances are infinite. The rolling black walls of water reach for the even blacker sky, scraping across it like the clawing hands of drowned giants. There's no help in a place like that. No rescue team that could arrive in time. No emergency number to call. No Christ to calm the waters. Just a few desperate primates clinging to a hunk of metal, caught in the path of nature's wrath. It was no wonder I couldn't sleep. If I had been able to catch some shut-eye in the heaving, creaking guts of the ship, I might not have seen the man in the water, and everything would be different. He was drifting toward us, just an orange dot on the crest of a massive wave. Only the flashing red light on his life jacket allowed me to track his position as he drew closer. We were his only chance. We all knew it. But my crewmates weren't born yesterday. In every one of our grim, tense faces, I could see the same reluctance, the same cold calculation. We all knew the dangers of going out there, and no one wanted to be the first to volunteer. Maybe it was because I'd seen him first, or maybe I just knew that, since I was one of the only crew members already in a dry suit, it had to be me. Whatever the reason, I headed for the door. Andre, a glum Russian who smoked more than he talked, nodded to me. He was coming too. I felt a surge of gratitude toward this man I hardly knew, now risking his life so that I wouldn't have to go alone. A white cap sloshed water through the door the moment we opened it. The wind howled like a living thing, and it was a struggle just to clip into our harnesses. The cables that bound us to the ship were capable of withstanding hundreds of pounds of force, but that night they felt as flimsy as butcher's twine. In the face of such awesome power, all we could do was hurl a life preserver toward the tiny, doomed figure in the orange life jacket and hope he'd be able to grab it in time. The ship was closing on him fast, and there would be no second chance. I hesitated. If I threw and missed, the man's death would be on my hands. I felt Andre tug the life preserver from my hands, and it made a strange arc as it flew through the stormy skies. Somehow, it landed in the path of the man in the orange life jacket. By swimming with the storm, he was able to reach the life preserver, but only just. As Andre and I hauled him in, I found myself glancing at the ever larger waves on the horizon and wondered if we were all going to drown in these frigid seas soon enough. We didn't even look at the man we'd fished out of the storm until we were back behind the ship's groaning metal walls. Whoever he was, his dry suit looked eerily familiar. With its red color and silver reflective triangles, it could have come from our own supply. Seawater dripped from the hair hanging over the man's face. I was working to free him from his life jacket when I noticed the logo on the orange material. It was the name of our ship. In fact, all of his gear was from our ship. Andre must have realized the same thing at the same time, because for a moment, there was no sound apart from the roar of the storm. We were paralyzed 
by the impossibility of it. Davis read the name on his gear, a name I'd never heard. We were a small crew, and I knew every... You have to turn this ship around, Davis rasped through chattering teeth. There was terror in his sunken eyes, but it was more than fear of the storm. You don't recognize me, do you? He asked me, accusingly. Andre, what about you? Please, please say you know me. I had never seen the man before in my life, but somehow he knew who we were. What the hell is this? Andre grunted, picked the stranger up by his collar, and slammed him into the wall. Where did you come from, eh? How do you have our gear? Turn the ship around! The man shrieked. Droplets of chill water flew from his ragged hair as he screamed. We lurched over yet another huge wave. Everything that wasn't tied down slid wildly to the left. We all lost our footing. Davis freed himself from Andre's grip and took off running toward the bridge. I don't know how he knew his way through those twisting, badly painted hallways. I don't know how he was even able to move after being buffeted by the icy waves. But I did know that if this madman attempted to turn this ship around, we were all dead men. The moment one of those waves hit us broadside, it would flip the cargo ship like a toy. Then it would be the nightmare that I'd had since I'd taken this job. One that maybe all sailors have. The sickening pitch, the sudden rush of heart-stopping ice-cold water, the limbs that tire, the lungs that drown, the blackness that swallows everything. I could almost feel it nipping at my heels as I skidded on the slick floor and grasped for the stranger's life jacket. On the bridge, I could hear my crewmates whispering about her chances in frightened tones. Their conversations stopped dead when the stranger careened into the room. Don't, don't, don't you know me? He panted. I could see the desperation in his eyes as they darted from one confused face to another. Don't any of you know me? Grab him! Andre was yelling. He's fucking crazy! We pitched down another wave, and suddenly, everyone was too busy hanging on to worry about the stranger. A coffee cup fell to the floor and shattered. Davis grabbed a sharp ceramic shard and ran toward the one person who hadn't said a word, hadn't panicked, but instead had kept her full focus on guiding us through the storm. Captain Erica Mitchell. I'd served on this ship before Captain Mitchell joined, and I had to admit, I didn't think much of the idea of having a woman for captain at first. Ours was rough, hard, solitary work, and I wasn't alone in seeing it as a man's work. But after seven years of serving under her, there was no one's hand I would have preferred at the helm. If there was anyone who could get us through this, it was her. And now her life was in danger. My fellow crewmen leapt to their feet, but it was too late. Davis had grabbed Captain Mitchell and was holding the ceramic shard so tightly against her neck that a trickle of blood flowed down her collar. Don't any of you move, the stranger muttered. Don't any of you dare fucking move. Captain Mitchell kept her hands up, calm as always. The bigger problem, I saw, was that with Mitchell incapacitated and the stranger refusing to allow anyone near the helm, steering would be impossible. More mountain-like waves rose ahead of us. They were endless and as awesome as they were terrifying. Gale force winds whipped the spray from the whitecaps, and for a moment, there was silence. Let's all just take it easy. Captain Mitchell kept her voice under control. Let's start with you. Who are you, friend? What do you want? Look! Davis licked his lips. See that clock on the wall? It reads 2.56. At 3.03, we're going to see something out there. Something even bigger than those waves. Something that wants to keep us trapped in our final moments, devouring our fear and anguish in a loop forever. I think we were all staring at him with the same dumbfounded face. But a few of us were moving, creeping closer to the stranger hoping he wouldn't notice until we were near enough to pounce. Turning around in the storm will kill us all. You know it, I know it. But trust me, that's better than what's up ahead. Lightning flashed. We could see nothing on the horizon but more of the endless storm. Just think about it, the man rambled. What can you remember before the storm? Before tonight? Now! The chief mate, who'd been a linebacker in college, tackled Davis. Captain Mitchell jabbed her elbow into his ribs, and he dropped his ceramic shard with a gasp. No! The stranger screamed. You have to believe me! We're heading for a fate worse than death! The clock read 2.58. Captain Mitchell pressed a napkin to her bleeding neck. 
Chief Mate Anderson had taken over the helm. The stranger continued to flail around, screaming incomprehensibly about fear drinkers and loops and monsters outside time. Keeping him restrained was no easy task, especially with the way the ship was rocking. But for some reason, Andre was holding me back. Take him below, Captain Mitchell murmured. Why was everyone staring at me? Let's go, Andre sighed, his hand on my shoulder. What? What's going on? I muttered, shaking off his hand. It was only by chance that I glanced through the bathroom door, curled open by the rocking of the ship, and saw my face in the mirror above the sink. My face. Davis's face. I looked at the name tags on my dry suit, my life jacket. It all read Davis. What the hell was going on? Easy, Andre warned. But I had to know. I still had my harness from when we'd rescued the stranger from the sea. That man who was me. I still had on my dry suit, my life jacket. If I moved fast, I waited for another wave to rock the ship before I sprinted for the door that led to the bow. Andre gave chase. His big, strong hands grabbed my life jacket while I was still fighting to get the door open. But the surge of water that rushed inside when it opened allowed me to slip free. I clipped on and clung to the railing, the gale force winds buffeting me like a rag doll as I slogged toward the bow. I had to see what lay ahead. My watch read 301. Andre yelled something incomprehensible behind me. The ship's sirens blared. Freezing waves knocked my feet from under me like a horrible prelude a nightmarish teaser for the rolling black water below. When it became too difficult to stand, I crawled. Only the frail tether of my harness held me to the ship. It might snap at any moment. Then I saw it, an enormous, indescribable shape, darker than the night sky. In its impossible limbs, our ship would be no larger than a child's toy. I wasn't sure if it had eyes, but I could feel it looking at us just the same. We were heading straight for it. As we crested another wave, I could see the thousands of cockroach-like limbs that lined its chest rustled together with anticipation. Its slimy black tendrils, each as wide as a city bus, lashed against the stormy sky. 303. Even at this distance, the thing on the horizon had already begun to drink my mind. The process was pure agony. Memories, dreams, hopes, nightmares. I could feel each one fading as it was sucked out of me. But there was no way to fight it, no way to hold on, except I looked down into the frothing black water below. If I could escape the loop, if I could go back, if I could warn us. Hanging onto the railing by the crook of my elbow, I fought the salt spray to prepare my dry suit for immersion. I turned on the flashing red light on my life jacket. My eyes paused when they passed over my name. Yes. Davis, that was it, stitched on the life jacket, onto the dry suit. I saw the logo of our ship. This time, they'd believe me, they had to. I'd find a way. If not, we'd be trapped in this nightmarish storm forever. With one last look at the writhing monstrosity on the horizon, I took a deep breath, unclipped my harness, and threw myself into the sea. Eagleside is a rough part of the city. There's enough street crime to make most people think twice about moving here. And few venture out from their houses at night, opting to stay inside after sundown. As a delivery driver, I don't get those luxuries. I'm out here all hours of the day and night, dropping off beer, liquor, pizza, cigarettes, you name it, to the citizens of Eagleside, good and bad alike. I've got my own company. I call it Bud's Brews. On account of the fact that my name is Bud, and beer just happens to be my number one seller. I've got cases of it in my garage, so that after hours I can still hook people up. You can call me at 4.30 a.m. and I'll come by and keep your party going. It might not be your favorite brand, and I'll charge you double for the privilege. But most people don't give a damn by that point. Some people will pay anything to keep the party going, even if it's just a one-man show and there ain't no music playing. Saturday night had come and gone, but I was still out on the streets as usual, rocking the tunes in my Trans Am and lugging six cases in the back seat. I could fit a hell of a lot more in there if I bought a minivan, or even a sedan for that matter. But what do I look like to you? A soccer mom? 
Ain't no way in hell you'll see me driving a Dodge Caravan or a Camry. I'll blaze around town in muscle cars until the day I die. And fuck the price of gas while you're at it. Where was I? Oh yeah. So, it was the early morning hours of Sunday by that point, when I got called to deliver a case to some sorry sack on the north end of Eagleside. I'd been there before, and knew the way by heart. The guy asked for Bud Light, but I had Coors with me, so I told him I was all out, and he'd have to take what he could get. He spit into the phone but told me that'd be fine, and off I went towards the bastard's house. By the time I got there, he was already waiting for me at the bottom of the stairs, pacing back and forth from one foot to the other like he had to take a leak, which reminded me that was something I needed to do once in a while as well. Mind if I use your washroom? I asked as he took the case from me. He hooked his thumb towards the front door and I followed after him, then went in and relieved myself, feeling much better afterwards. I drove away back towards the middle of Eagleside to my usual place outside the McDonald's. That was always the best bet, since people ordered from there all night long and it was close to everything else as well. It didn't take long to get another call despite the time of night, now well past 3 a.m. Another party in North Eagleside, a one-man party once again. I put the car in gear and drove through green lights one after another. It was like tonight was destined to be my night, not a single red. And this next customer was a big tipper. I knew he'd be good for a 10, maybe even a 20. Flashing lights up ahead made me step on the brake suddenly, and I realized it was a hastily constructed roadblock set up by the police. Flares were burning steadily and had been placed along the road to funnel traffic in towards two cop cars. Rain was just beginning to fall, and I noticed with some surprise that the two officers were already wearing yellow rain slickers, as if they had been expecting the weather at exactly that moment, as if they had called it forth themselves with some dark, terrible magic. I never did like cops very much. I guess it's a bit of a personality defect. The sound of rain pattering softly outside could be heard as I rolled down my window. The cop tried to poke his flashlight into my car, aiming it at the cases of beer in the back, but the window wasn't rolled down far enough to allow for that. I knew the law, and I knew better than to allow them any access to my workspace. Hey, bud, he said, leaning down to sniff through the inch-wide window crack. The tip of his nose actually squeezed through the gap, and for a moment, I considered rolling it up. I imagined that mental image and almost burst out laughing, barely restraining myself. Busy night? He asked. No, I lied. It's been slow. Oh yeah? So you haven't been up to the North End tonight? I shook my head. Because the reason we're out here is there's been a murder. Man had a fresh case of beer too. And he didn't look like the type to have a fresh case this time of night. Only a single bottle was open, too. This really shook me to my core. My last customer? Was that who they were talking about? Was this for real? You guys are messing with me. What is this? Are you doing a sobriety check here or something? This is real, he said, looking serious. You can go on your way now. It's a free country. But be careful. There's a killer roaming Eagleside right now. And I think you might have just missed him. Next time, you might not be so lucky. His partner leaned down on the other side to look at me through the glass of the passenger window, as if taking me in. Move along now, he said. I began to drive, my hands trembling with fear, unsure if the two cops were messing with me. For years, I had skirted the laws around town. Secondhand sale of liquor without a license isn't exactly legal, after all. Not to mention, I didn't usually ID people or bother with any of that nonsense. My next stop was the rich guy's house, at least rich by Eagleside standards. He tipped me a $10 bill for my trouble and I left with a grin on my face. It wasn't two minutes later before I got another call. This one from a less generous tipper. At least he lived nearby though, and I had exactly what he wanted. I was over there in 10 minutes and made another five for the delivery. The son of a bitch didn't tip a red dime, but that was to be expected. So I asked to use his washroom and pissed all over his floor, leaving the seat up for his wife the next morning to fall in. 
By the time I got back to McDonald's, it was 4.30 a.m., and I was just about ready to call it a night. Not many customers bothered to keep drinking after that point, and I wasn't about to pull a double and start working an intermittent breakfast shift. Those were always hit or miss. Red lights lit up behind me, and I saw it was the police. The same two cops as before came knocking on my window, looking at me with worried faces. Yeah? I asked, feeling my eyelids drooping. Are you all right? The cop asked, sounding nervous. Uh, yeah. Why? I asked. It turned out there had been another killing, just after I left my previous customer, according to the cops. Given the circumstances, they needed to take me in for questioning. I agreed, since I had no choice, and went along willingly. I couldn't believe my ears. If not for my luck, I would have lost my life. My legs felt numb as I walked out of the interrogation room. Be careful, the police detective said, waving goodbye. There's still a killer out there. Stay safe, okay? I told him I would. And then just as I stepped outside, I got another call. Bob Vanders, from the west end of Eagleside. He wanted an Egg McMuffin and a coffee, and he was a terrible tipper. I remembered that much. I told him I'd be happy to, and I picked up his order. Tipping the vial of black poison into his coffee, I thought again about how much better my life was going to get once all the terrible customers were gone and only the good ones were left. It would take a while, that was true, but it would be worth it. And until then, I'd just have to work twice as hard. I flipped the cover open and pushed the red button. My eyes drift to the red message on the screen beside it. Lockdown measures initiated. All doors are now magnetically sealed. Surface charge is detonated. Life support systems permanently disabled. Hot tears stream down my face. I can't hear the explosions, but I can feel the station rumble as the caverns above collapse. The steady hum of air circulators fades. I know it's all in my head, but the air feels stuffy already. I see a caulk gun in a toolbox by the door. I use it to fill the space between the door and frame. It will probably make me suffocate faster, but I'm going to die anyway. I would rather die in control than spend my final hours filled with the worms. I joined Lamplight Station five years ago as a biologist. I'd spent most of my career examining samples of ancient wildlife found frozen in ice. Seldom seen species were my specialty. I'd performed biological assessment work for government agencies before. It was no surprise when the facility director, Dr. Jacoby from Lamplight Station, called to offer me a job. What started as a standard offer grew more strange by the moment. Which government entity will I be working for? And what is the nature of the research? I asked. Lamplight is operated by NASA in Colorado, he replied. The nature of the research is classified. I can have you on a plane this evening and discuss the specifics after you complete a few NDAs. I was on a plane later that night. An SUV picked me up from my hotel the following morning. As we drove, I asked the driver to tell me about the station, but his answers were sparse. After what seemed like an eternity of driving, we passed through multiple security gates and reached an unassuming metal building. This is Lamplight Station? I asked the driver. No, sir. That is the entrance, he responded. Please step inside. Dr. Jacoby will take you down. I exited the car and headed into the shed. Inside stood a bespeckled man with hard eyes and thin hair. He feigned a smile and extended his hand to shake mine. Dr. Malcolm Jacoby, he said. You must be Dr. Ethan Stafford. Please follow me. I followed him to a plexiglass covered elevator. He scanned a key card, opening the doors. We stepped inside and he punched the only button on the panel. We began to glide down. I waited for Dr. Jacoby to offer information on the nature of the work, but he faced away in silence. It wouldn't have been uncomfortable if the descent hadn't taken nearly five minutes. My mind was swimming as I considered how deep we must be going. Dr. Jacoby, I said, could you tell me about the nature of this project? 
As a biologist, I'm not sure I have much to offer NASA. It will be much easier to show you, he responded. Some things defy conventional knowledge. The elevator came to a stop. We stepped out into a concrete tunnel covered in a maze of pipes and banded wires. A few people in white lab coats wandered down the cross sections of corridors, staring at clipboards. Dr. Jacoby beckoned me to follow him through the facility. After winding through a labyrinth of twisting corridors, we arrived at a decontamination chamber with a row of hazmat suits hanging from the wall. Jacoby began to place one on and requested I do the same. After we passed through a cycle in the decontamination chamber, we entered a laboratory bustling with half a dozen staff. There were dozens of plexiglass cases lining the walls. In each, I could see a thin, black shape resting at the bottom. Mr. Estrada, he said, please retrieve specimens one through five and move their containment units to the center table. A man nodded to Jacoby and retrieved the cases. Once I was able to see that the things in the boxes looked like earthworms, thick and black, but very much like the most common species I've seen. Sir, I'm not sure what help I will be studying worms, I said. One of the worms wiggled lethargically. They may appear to be worms, Dr. Stafford, he said, but all 39 specimens in this room were removed from the hull of the International Space Station. Over my years at Lamplight, I did nothing but pour over 23 years worth of the videos and documentation logs on the worms. They were discovered on the hull of the ISS in 1998 during a routine exterior maintenance trip. The crewmen initially thought they were chunks of discharged waste, but on closer inspection, they realized they were looking at biological organisms. During a supply run, they were returned to Earth, and Lamplight was developed to study the first documented example of extraterrestrial life. The worms were kept in separate containment units. They refused to consume any provided food or water. The specimens rarely move. They produce no waste. It is almost as though they are in a constant state of hibernation, unless they were placed within a foot of each other. When placed within close proximity, they begin to move wildly, smashing into the side of their case, trying to reach one another. Experiments were performed where two of the worms were removed from their case and placed together. They would instantly join together and move in a tandem motion. As the experiments continued, researchers placed four worms in the same box. They would cluster together, moving as a single unit. The more of them they placed together, the more advanced movements they were able to make together. At Dr. Jacoby's direction, all 39 worms were placed into a single box. They formed a cluster and began to move as a solitary unit. When the box was opened to separate them again, they formed a net and wrapped around the face mask of the researcher. After ripping a hole in the mask, they entered the body through their nostrils and ear canals. The infected researcher became violent toward the other staff until subdued. After being placed in restraints, they continued to struggle until they died of exhaustion. Even after the infected worker ceased showing life signs, the deceased corpse continued to move. While still restrained, an autopsy was performed. The worms had grown and bonded into a writhing black muscular system. Pale strands protruded from the worms into the tissue and organs. Together, they formed a parasite that could assume control of the human body, alive or dead. Scattered throughout the body were numerous partially developed larvae. During the control process, the worms attempted to reproduce. The final count after the undeveloped larvae were removed totaled 327. After watching the autopsy video, Dr. Jacoby took me to his office and showed me a large red button on the wall behind his desk. In the event of another infection, any available staff are to activate the self-destruction system. It will destroy the entire facility. Though it hadn't been done since that day, I put in place a rule that no worms would be allowed in the proximity of another while I remained on staff at Lamplight. My study of the worms continued until this morning. I had the day off, so I decided to spend the day in Denver. Research studies were put on hold when I was out of the building, 
so I thought my absence would allow the staff a bit of relaxation for themselves. I returned to Lamplight in the early evening and made the long descent down the shaft. When I exited the elevator, I was surprised to see no security staff manning the check-in station. The halls were silent. As I turned the first corner, I saw a leg jutting out from a dormitory door. I approached cautiously. When I arrived, I looked around the corner to see a grisly scene. One of the facility personnel was face down on the floor in a red pool of blood. I backed away in panic and looked further into the dorm. Dozens of bodies lay scattered on the floor. In a panic, I ran toward the containment lab. The closer I got, the more bodies I saw. I wanted to scream, but I was too frightened that whoever had done this would hear me and come for me next. Horror after horror awaited as I grew closer to the lab. It was finally in view, and I could see a man standing in the center of the lab through the glass panel windows. Glasses hung from one of his ears, and his thin wisps of hair stuck out wildly. He twitched and convulsed as he gazed at the scattered and broken containment units on the floor. It was Dr. Jacoby. I crept slowly toward the door. There was an emergency door lock on the decontamination unit to stop anyone who had been infected from leaving the containment lab. Dr. Jacoby turned around just as I pushed the locking mechanism into place. The locks clicked. Dr. Jacoby began to throw himself wildly against the plexiglass wall. He pounded ferociously against the glass and pressed his face against it. Although his actions were those of a cornered animal, his facial expression was one of sorrow and remorse. I thought I would have them back in their units before you returned. He howled as his limbs bashed at the barrier. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Hit the button. I started to back away, horrified. Jacoby wailed, writhing black tendrils exposed in his mouth. I ran for the office. The air is starting to get thin in here now. My breathing is labored, and I'm starting to feel weak. My mind is getting foggy. I better rest my eyes for a second. I just need a little rest. You ever been on a boat before, Lucas? Asked the burly man on the pier. Dangerous work. A man's liable to go over the side if he ain't careful. I ran my hands through my mop of auburn hair. I had sent in an application months before and told the captain I had no experience on the water, but maybe he didn't see that part. It had worried me at that moment that I may be about to lose the job before I even started. No, sir, I replied. I have no experience on a boat. I know how to swim and have spent time at the lakes back home, but nothing like this. Captain Orange furrowed his brow as he looked me over. It was hard to determine his age. All of his hair had gone gray, and his face was lined with deep wrinkles. His body was a stout rack of muscle. He was either in his later years, or life on the sea had worn him down. My business manager must not have looked over your application too well, he said dismissively. Crabbing on the Bering Sea ain't a game. You young folks watch some damn show on the Discovery Channel and think it's a quick payday. It ain't. Not sure this is gonna be for you. I grabbed my duffel bag from the wet concrete and turned to walk back to the hotel. My mind raced between the disappointment of rejection and the panic of having to pay for a plane ticket home. My bank account was nearly drained and I would have to use my already maxed out credit card. Hang on, he shouted. Be here at six in the morning tomorrow. It's too damn late for me to find a new deckhand, and you're just gonna have to learn to be useful real quick. If you can't keep up, crab ain't gonna be the only thing we dump at the port. The old man turned and walked back onto the deck of his boat before vanishing into the wheelhouse. F.V. Weeping Widow rocked gently against the pier. I spent the first two hours of our trip to the Bering Sea, violently dumping my breakfast into the filthy toilet just off the kitchen. Every time I retched, I could hear the other deckhands howl with laughter outside. 
Captain Orange had told the crew to hit their bunks for a bit of rest before we reached the crabbing grounds. But their laughter and jeers made it clear they had no intention of heeding the advice. It seemed like all of my stomach contents had successfully ejected when pounding began to sound against the thin wooden door. All right, Greenhorn, one of the deckhands shouted. Time to get off your ass and on your feet. We'll be dropping pot soon, and that herring won't hop in the bait bag. Let's move. I could hear the sounds of their voices growing quiet and the thuds of heavy boots heading up the steps under the deck. Wiping my face on my sleeve, I pushed myself onto my feet and walked out the door. The smell of beer and cigarette smoke nearly made my seasick stomach turn again, but I managed to press the urge back down. Pushing the bulkhead door open, I entered the equipment room where the other hands were slipping into their cold weather gear and waders. A big man who I thought was named Jimmy shoved a bright orange bodysuit into my hands and smacked me on the shoulder. I looked at it in confusion. It was completely different from the gear the other men were wearing. What's this? I asked the man. It doesn't look like the same gear the rest of you have. That's an immersion suit, son. He responded with mild annoyance. Captain told us you've never been out to sea before and got no boat experience. Me and all the boys think you'll fall overboard, and this is the only thing likely to save your rookie ass. The other man began to howl with laughter again. I began to put on the enormous suit, unsure if it was a joke or not. There was no other gear in the room, so my options were limited. The others began to file out of the bulkhead and onto the deck. After five minutes of struggling into the immersion gear, I was finally ready to join them outside. Cutting wind and water slapped my face as soon as I stepped onto the deck. The other hands scurried from crab pots, cinching ropes, and checking for holes. Jimmy stood beside an industrial grinder and waved me over. Grab these bait bags and we'll start lining them up over at the pot launch, he said, gesturing to a pile of mesh sacks filled to the brim with ground fish. Gotta hurry if you wanna keep the job. I grabbed as many of the bait bags as I could and began to clumsily waddle toward the launcher at the side of the ship. The immersion suit was unbelievably bulky and made it difficult to bend my legs to walk. My feet slipped and shuffled as I tried to find purchase on the wet deck boards. I had just finished dropping the first load of bait bags when the boat grew silent. The engines had stopped. There was no more hurried noise from the crew who had been readying the crab pots to launch. An electric sensation of fear jolted through my body in the sudden silence. I turned toward the deck to see all seven deckhands surrounding me in a semicircle. Just as I was about to speak, I heard the door from the wheelhouse open and slam closed. Looking up, Captain Orange stood against the railing, hands clenched around the frigid metal, a grim look on his face. It ain't personal, Lucas. He shouted. We've got a tradition here on the Weeping Widow. Every four or five years, me and the boys sacrifice a man to the sea. Keeps the rest of us safe. Superstitious? Maybe. But we ain't lost a man accidentally in 22 years. That suit will give you a few hours to get right with whatever god you pray to. At first, I thought it was a joke but a few of the men pulled work knives from their belts as they all walked toward me. Captain Orange had already turned and walked back into the wheelhouse, slamming the door behind him. The engines roared to life and the boat jolted forward. Over the side, Jimmy said, or the boils will have to stab you a few times to inspire you. Please. I screamed at the men as they slowly closed in on me. Don't do this. Just take me back. I won't tell anyone. They remained silent and continued forward. The first man was in arm's reach and leaned in to grab me. I swung my fist as hard as I could and made contact with the side of his head. He stumbled back, shocked at the unexpected blow. As I prepared myself to throw another blow, the others began to move in faster. While I was distracted by the first man, the others seized the opportunity to tackle me to the railing of the ship. I thrashed violently and hit every man within reach, but it was
was no good. I felt two of them wrap their arms around my ankles and lift me into the air. My hands clenched around the metal railing and they tipped me over the side. Grip still in place, I slammed against the hull of the ship and looked up in horror. Seven crazed faces stared down at me, smiling with sadistic glee. One of the men began trying to pry my fingers from the rails, but the sudden surge of adrenaline had increased my strength. No matter how hard he pulled my fingers or slammed his fist down, my grip wouldn't break. Then I saw one of the men vanish. He returned moments later with a hammer. Lifting the hammer above his head, he brought it down on my left hand with a sickening crack. White blurs of pain filled my eyes as I heard the sickening crunch. My left hand spasmed in pain and fell from the railing. The weight of my body strained my right arm as I continued to hold onto the rail. My muscles burned with agony as I watched him lift the hammer a second time. The second wave of pain swept my body as the hammer made contact. My vision went black. The splintered bones of my right hand gave way and I fell to the churning sea below. My loss of consciousness was momentary. I felt as though I slammed against concrete as my body met with the rough waves below. The unimaginable cold encompassed my body almost instantly and any hope of drifting away to a peaceful death vanished. I began to struggle against the waves and paddled my arms to turn myself upright. Fresh bolts of pain erupted in my hands and shot up my arms as I tried to use them to right myself in the water. The suit had kept me dry, but the bulk made it nearly impossible to control my movements. Finally, I managed to get myself onto my back and floated on top of the choppy sea. Whitecap waves lapped and slammed against me, filling my mouth with briny water and making it difficult to breathe. As soon as I passed over the top of a new wave, I would coast back down the back and dip below the water before coming back up and gasping for air. I could see the F.V. Weeping Widow rocking gently on the waves and the spotlight moved into the distance. A man was standing at the back of the boat, one arm propped on the railing and the other waving merrily in my direction. It looked like he lowered it to blow me a kiss. Thank you, Greenhorn, he shouted with glee. If my kids knew what you sacrificed to keep their old man safe, they'd thank you too. Please, I shouted. I slipped under the water again. Come back. Another white cap swelled over my head, filling my mouth with salty water. Don't leave me. A larger wave pushed me a few feet under, sending water into my lungs. I can't, please. The lights vanished over the rolling waves, leaving me in the pitch dark. The water began to calm a bit as the wake of the boat settled. My balance returned, and I began to float calmly in the water. Stars burned brightly overhead. I had never been this far away from a city to see them so clearly. They would have been beautiful in any other setting. There, in the Bering Sea, the stars would be the only witnesses to my funeral. I drifted for hours. The immersion suit had kept the worst of the cold at bay for a while but I had eventually started to feel the icy daggers of the frigid water creep into my muscles. I had given up on trying to swim. My body ached and it hurt to move. Hopelessness had overtaken me and I simply waited to die. After letting go of the fear and anxiety, I noticed I felt a bit better. The water didn't seem to be as cold now. My body aches were dissipating. I felt almost comfortable. Hypothermia. Late stage, probably. It's no way to go. But by the time the false warmth starts filling your body, you're almost thankful. I had decided to close my eyes and rest and let the ocean take me. When I heard something in the distance, a rumbling sound, a ship's engine, I opened my eyes and scanned the area and in the distance, I could see a dim light. There was a ship passing to my right. Too far away to see me. Too far away to hear me scream. I rested my hands on my chest as tears filled my eyes. My hands rested on top of a hard, found piece of plastic. 
confused. I fumbled at it with my bent and broken fingers until I felt a bump on the side. Pushing it in, the night sky filled with obnoxious light. The damn suit had a strobe. I had been out here for hours and never checked the suit for any gear. There was no telling how many ships might have passed close enough to see it, but in my panic, I never checked. Bright flashes of light nearly blinded me as they radiated in the night sky. I shielded my eyes with my crippled hand and turned my head toward the boat passing me by. My mind was foggy, but I thought I could see a spotlight burst to life on the deck. A thin beam of harsh light began to scan the sea all around me. With great effort, I lifted my arms in the air to wave, hoping the reflective tape on the sides of the suit would catch their attention as well. After a few moments, the spotlight fell on me, and I had to shield my eyes completely. The light remained on me for what felt like an eternity until I could hear the deafening roar of the engine of a ship nearby. Waves began to crash violently against me. Once again, I struggled to keep my head above water and breathe. This is the United States Coast Guard. A resonating voice called from the ship's loudspeaker. We will dispatch a rescue team to pull you aboard. A few moments later, I was pulled into an inflatable boat. There were a few men and women on board talking into radios as we sped back to the larger ship. The luminous spotlight followed us the entire way. It was like a light from heaven, carrying me back to safe harbors. I started sobbing uncontrollably. A woman sitting next to me grabbed my hand to comfort me. The pain was excruciating, but I didn't bother telling her about my injuries. I was too relieved to be in the sight of another person that the pain was worth the contact. I squeezed her hand back as best as I could with my shattered fingers. We pulled alongside the Coast Guard boat and four cables dropped from a crane above. The rescue team started attaching the clasps to the boat and in moments we were lifted from the choppy sea. Tears flowed freely as we drifted upward to the deck. As we lifted above the side, the crane began to swing us onto the deck before gently lowering the boat. A swarm of warmly dressed men and women pulled me from the boat and put me on a stretcher. They chattered back and forth about care measures as my mind swam in the joy of my rescue. Hey there, big guy, one of the men said. Can you tell me how you ended up in the drink out there? You're a long way from land. Thrown overboard, I said in a croaky voice. Crabbing boat. Weeping widow, crew tossed me overboard. The man's expression changed from professionally friendly to concerned. Let me go grab the captain, he said before vanishing through the rest of the crew. A few moments later, a woman stood beside the stretcher as the crew pulled me from my wetsuit and wrapped me in blankets. The serious woman held a warm cup of coffee to my lips and I drank deeply. Sir. Can you please tell me what happened on the F.V. Weeping Widow? I told her how the crew had cornered me before throwing me from the boat. She listened intently as I explained to her how I had treaded water for hours and how I had struggled to flag down their passing vessel. She nodded and assured me that I would be safe. Her version of safe differed greatly from mine. I was flown back to the mainland and my hands were treated at a hospital in Anchorage. After my recovery, I was placed in an involuntary psychiatric hold for observation. The crew of the F.V. Weeping Widow all reported to authorities that I had become unstable after going out to sea. After running a string of crab pots, the captain had given the crew a few hours of rack time. While everyone was in their bunk, I must have snuck to the equipment room, put on the immersion suit, and jumped overboard in an elaborate suicide attempt. None of the crew faced charges, and the hospital eventually released me to fly home, broken and destitute. I'll never be the same. Yet the F.V. Weeping Widow still sails as it always has. Every year they still lose one sailor to the sea. Only I know the truth. Is the recorder on? I don't see the red light. Wait. Okay, I see it now. Sorry. I'm just a little nervous. Look, 
Bob always seemed like a decent enough guy. He was a little quiet, sure, but very friendly. Working as an accountant at an insurance company isn't the most exciting job in the world and doesn't tend to attract the most exciting people either. We didn't know him well enough, even though he'd been there about a decade. His office was pretty sterile. No picture of a wife or a husband for that matter. No pictures of children. He never shared personal details about his life. Everyone in the office would invite him to birthday parties or potlucks at lunch, but he just stayed in his office. Ate at his desk every day as far back as I can remember. A bologna sandwich, a bottle of water, and half of a banana. Never deviated from his routine. Seemed like a good enough guy though. Mr. Applegate, our manager, he was less pleasant. He was a micromanager if I ever met one. No detail of a project was too small for him to scrutinize. The guy would rip you to shreds in a meeting for the smallest error. Everyone walked on eggshells around him. I don't think anyone deserved what happened to him though. During an afternoon meeting, Mr. Applegate was lecturing the staff about the importance of double checking all financial documents for final submission. Our error percentage on financial reports last month had increased from 1% to 1.5%. In our favor, mind you. But that was beside the point to Mr. Applegate. And who do we have to thank for making us look like a cluster of morons to the head office? Mr. Applegate asked us dramatically. Bob Brooks, accountant extraordinaire. Stand up, Bob, so we can give you a round of applause for sending out the wrong numbers. Bob stood hesitantly as Mr. Applegate clapped loudly. No one else joined him. We just felt bad for Bob. We'd all taken our share of insults over the years, but we'd never seen Mr. Applegate go after Bob. Sometime in March, Mr. Applegate stopped showing up to work. It was out of the blue. He had worked there for over 20 years, and you could set your watch by the time he walked in the door each day. Things went on as usual for a few days, but it became clear he wasn't coming back. He ignored every phone call or email sent his way. A rep from corporate stopped by at the end of the week and called Bob into the conference room. The rep had decided Bob would be our interim manager until the position was filled. Most of us were indifferent. He wasn't anyone's friend, but no one disliked him. To our surprise, Bob was a fantastic manager. The office ran more smoothly than ever. Productivity was up. We weren't being micromanaged. Bob stayed in his office most of the day, unless he needed something specific, which wasn't often. He took care of the corporate side of things and we took care of the day-to-day -day operations. It was nice, really. At the end of the last quarter, Bob surprised us with a big announcement. According to the main office, he said quietly, our numbers are the highest in the state. You have all done excellent work. As a reward, we will have a barbecue in the empty field beside the parking lot. I will put a sign-up sheet on the break room door for sides and drinks, but I'll bring the main course. With that, he headed back to his office. The day of the cookout arrived and we all met in the field at the end of the day. A few of those folding tables sat on the edge of the parking lot by the field covered with food. You know, casseroles and dips, things like that. There was Bob, standing behind the grill cooking steaks and smiling happily to himself. We all ate until we thought we'd be sick. I'll be damned if that wasn't how it turned out. Anyway, the part you wanted to know. We had just finished packing up from the barbecue Bob sat in front of me at the exit onto the main road. I guess he didn't see the car coming when he pulled out and the red Jeep clipped the back of his van, knocking open the back door and sending his white cooler crashing to the ground. That's when I saw it. Couldn't tell exactly what it was at first. There were some leftover steaks from the cookout scattered on the road. I thought there were steaks anyway. Shit, I feel sick thinking about it. That's when I saw the hand sticking out of the cooler. Before I could register what I was looking at, 
Bob peeled away in his damaged van, leaving the cooler behind. I don't know why the hell I got out and looked, but I did. Already told your officers my fingerprints would be on the lid of the cooler. I lifted up the lid, and that's when the arm rolled out. Inside were the rest of the pieces of Mr. Applegate, the parts we didn't eat at the cookout. I don't know why he did it. Have you found him yet? I didn't want to be a delivery man. Nobody chooses this life for themselves. Nobody grows up with the dream planted in their mind that they want to be the world's fastest pizza guy one day. Driving around in a beat up jalopy with the smell of pepperoni in your nose. You know what sucks the most about it? You know that smell of delicious, fresh baked pizza that makes your mouth water when you get a pie delivered? When you're a delivery guy, you just get to sit in that smell all day. And then you don't get to eat the pizza. You just get to smell it and let your mouth fill with saliva. Thinking about how you wish you made more money so you could afford to buy an extra large with all the toppings, garlic bread crust, and a side of hot wings with blue cheese dipping sauce for good measure. That's where I was at mentally as I sat in my shitty car, my battery slowly dying as I listened to the radio and enjoyed the last little bit of light afforded by the headlamps. Tow truck's gonna be here soon, I kept telling myself, smelling the pizza in the back seat. Any minute, the tow truck is gonna be here. I rolled down the window and stuck my head out, craning my neck to see into the distance behind me. The smell of the fresh, Autumn night air filled my nostrils and replaced the cheese and hot baked dough and tomato sauce. At first, I thought there was a pair of headlights, but then whatever it was blinked out of existence and disappeared, like the glowing eyes of some great cat. I rolled up the window quickly, shivering from the cold draft as it filled the car. The address was supposed to be right here. I had actually been idling while I checked the directions on my phone. The GPS confirmed that I was where I was supposed to be, but there was no driveway, just untouched forest surrounding the road as far as the eye could see. Somehow, I had run out of gas, despite my tank being half full. When I checked the time, it was as if I had been daydreaming for hours, like I had been in a trance while looking for the address on my phone. The sun had gone down at some point, and it was well past 11 at night, the moon overhead glowing an eerie pumpkin orange. That was when I had called the tow truck, but it seemed as if they weren't coming. Confused and bewildered, I got out of the car and looked around, wondering if they had gotten lost. I pulled my phone out and hit the redial button for the towing company, but this time all I got was static, as if whoever had picked up the phone was in a different dimension, separated from me by a wall of entropy. The brush on the other side of the road suddenly began to rustle and sway, as if something were moving behind it, trying to stay hidden but too large to manage that successfully. Hello? I called out, hearing the quiver in my own voice and wishing I sounded braver, wishing I were braver. Who's there? Another sound came from behind me, and I spun around to get back in the car, terrified of whatever was stalking me so far out in the middle of this night black forest. But the car door slammed shut as I bumped into it with my wide hips. Too many hours of sitting and not enough sit-ups. Too many undeliverable pizzas eaten in parking lots for half price. Too many years of not taking care of myself taunted me as I grabbed the door handle and tried to pull it open, but found it locked. The keys still inside, jammed into the ignition slot, mocking me. The rustling sound came again, and this time it was from behind another tree, and another. Movements were heard on all sides as my eyes darted back and forth from place to place, seeing huge, hulking shadows hiding behind the trees all around. Who's there? I nearly shrieked, my voice high and breaking. Stay back! I've got a gun! I didn't have anything of the sort, but it was the only thing which came to mind that could potentially ward off threats of such size and terrifying proportions. A shadow began to emerge from behind one of the trees, and another came from behind me. I heard their huge, lumbering footsteps coming closer as their features became discernible in the waning light of the moon. 
Their faces were obscured by the shadows of tree limbs and broken boughs above us. The half bare branches shedding leaves like dead tissue, falling all around. The warmth of one creature's hot breath was in my face as I stood, petrified, nowhere to run. My back was pressed up against the cold steel of the car, the window glass squeaking against my skin as I trembled with fear. Sharp, long, hooked and pointed teeth grated together as gray lips pulled back into a grin. A mouth as wide as a windshield opened up as if to devour me, its pointed tongue salivating and dripping. And then it surprised me by speaking, its voice a rumbling baritone, deep enough to shake my teeth in their sockets. Are you from Domino's? It asked, spraying me with fine droplets of spittle. The acid burn of them sizzled on my cheeks. I ordered eight large pizzas to this address. My hand was shaking badly as I hooked a thumb towards the back seat. In the, 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 the there, I managed to stutter. Locked by m m mistake. There was a heavy, deep sounding sigh as the creature was clearly annoyed by my amateur actions. But instead of eating me as an alternative, he smashed the window with his claw and reached inside, removing the boxes. A big cold, the thing said, sounding irritated. You look to be warm-blooded, though. Your blood might make for an interesting marinara. A screeching roar came from the woods, and the creature huffed and let out a sigh. Yes, mother. I suppose we should leave him alive. Otherwise, who will deliver way out here? He began to stalk back into the darkness of the forest, leaving me behind in my soiled and warm, wet pants. It is so hard to find good help these days. You really must bring back that 30-minute guarantee. We used to get so much free pizza in this dimension. What dimension? I called after the thing, looking around with confusion at the forest of trees whose branches now whipped and coiled like angry snakes. How the hell was I going to get home? I looked down and saw a $50 bill was laying at my feet with the head of a monster in place of President Grant. Shit, not again. At least these guys tipped better than the last place though. Every time I found one of those damned yellow sticky notes on my monitor, I knew it would be a bad day. My secret admirer had that effect on me. The note started out kind of charming. A few polite compliments about my clothing. A note about how kind and gentle my personality was. Little XOXO signatures at the bottom. Middle school crush style. It was a bit of an ego boost, but I was happily married. My wife Emily and I had a rough stretch a few years back after I had an affair, but we got things back on track. I thought of telling her about the notes, but I didn't want to worry her. The flirtatious post-its went into the trash and I moved on with my day. I didn't give the first dozen or so much thought until they began to threaten me. The first note that left me with an unsettling feeling showed up two months after the first one. Gone were the free-flowing, delicate curves of the handwriting. Heavy grooves gouged into the paper from the heavy block letters etched on the surface. Why don't you answer me back? You could leave a note for me on your computer. It seems like you don't care. It's starting to make me angry. XOXO. At first, I laughed it off before wadding up the note and tossing it in the trash. The idea of leaving a note for my admirer was ridiculous. They had never even mentioned wanting me to leave a reply before. How the hell was I supposed to know my computer monitor was like their own personal mailbox? Two days later when I arrived to work, there were two notes attached to my monitor. The first one was the angry message from a few days before. It had been uncrumpled and smoothed out. Underneath sat another note on clean, uncrinkled yellow paper. You just wad up my messages and throw them in the trash? What the hell is wrong with you? You used to be something special to me, but now I see you're just like every other guy I've met. I was wrong about you. You're a piece of garbage, XOXO. I felt a mixture of anger and relief at the note. Whoever this woman was, 
She didn't know me well enough to make judgment calls like that about me. At the same time, it seemed like this could be the end of the whole strange ordeal. That time, I put the notes in my pocket and tossed them into a trash can in the parking garage on my way home. Whoever was leaving them, they were checking the trash in my office. With any luck, they would move on and get over their fixation. No such luck. Only a few days later, there was another sticky note on my monitor. This time it was neon green. Had they written me so many damn notes that their yellow pad had run out? My throat tightened as I pulled it from the screen and read, We all have our shortcomings, but I'm willing to forgive you. Please stop throwing away my notes. These little moments mean so much to me and it hurts to know you don't feel the same. That's okay though. Your feelings for me will change with time. If they don't, I may have to hurt someone. XO, XO. I immediately took the note to the HR office. One of the reps read it. Her eyebrows raised and her head held back in surprise. She placed it down on her desk and pulled off her reading glasses. How long has this been going on, Paul? She asked me in a concerned tone. I'm not sure exactly, I said, scratching my head. They've left a dozen notes, two dozen maybe. Do we have security cameras on the floor? No, she said, shaking her head. No cameras, I'm afraid, too expensive. Same reason they laid off the security officer in the building. Post-COVID America isn't exactly thriving. She gave me a look of sympathy and told me to tell her if any more notes showed up on my computer. I nodded and told her I would. We both silently acknowledged that this was the first of many conversations on the matter. Over the next few weeks, I made multiple trips to the HR office to report the notes. They rambled endlessly about how heartless I was, how angry I'd made them, and the violent things they would do to me if I didn't respond soon. It was becoming exhausting. Last week when I arrived to work, there was a hot pink sticky note on my computer monitor. I was at a breaking point. The notes wouldn't stop. HR didn't know who was leaving them, and my place of work was doing nothing to put an end to this. At that moment, I would have done anything to get it to end. The note offered the option. I get it, you're not interested. I'll back off, but only if you meet me tonight. I'll be on the fifth level of the parking garage near the stairwell exit. 8 p.m., don't be late. XOXO. It was 7.58 p.m. when I stepped out of the elevator onto the fifth floor of the parking garage. My heart was racing and a cold sweat ran down my back. From in front of the elevator, I had a clear view of the stairwell door about 200 feet away. No one was there. So I made my way in that direction to see if I could find them. Suddenly, a red ember glowed brightly in the shadow cast by the door. Someone was smoking a cigarette in the darkness. The muscles in my body tightened as I willed myself forward. My admirer was there, standing in the dark. Hello? I called out. A cloud of smoke billowed from the shadow. It's Paul. You wanted to meet me? A woman stepped out of the shadow and dropped the cigarette to the ground, grinding it with her foot. She held a gun in her left hand. It was my wife, Emily. Emily? I questioned. What the hell are you doing? I left the notes as a test. A few days a month I stop in your office on my way to work and leave notes. The cleaning crew thinks I work there, I guess, she said, her face streaming with tears. I thought after all the trouble we had from the affair, you would tell me if someone was trying to steal you away from me again. You, you left the notes? I stammered. What the hell is wrong with you? I wanted to be sure you wouldn't try to meet another woman again, she said, lifting the gun toward me. But you did. Here you are, trying to meet some easy score. Emily, you can't be serious, I shouted. I came here to get this to stop. Why are you doing this? I knew you would, 
she said, but was cut off by the eruption of police sirens. She looked toward the ramp at the flashing blue and red lights. You called the police? I nodded. Of course I did! I exclaimed. I thought someone was going to hurt me if... The thunder of the gunshot was all I heard before the world went black. I woke up in a hospital. My entire body ached. There were thick white bandages wrapped around my midsection. A nurse saw that I was conscious and ran to find the doctor. A police officer was in a chair beside me. After my physician entered the room, they explained that my wife had shot me in the abdomen and fled the scene. A manhunt was underway, but they hadn't located her yet. A protective detail would remain with me at the hospital until I was released. They never found her. That was about five years ago. I've relocated since then. New state, new job, new life. It's been relatively peaceful until recently. You see, yesterday I headed into the office a bit before the sun came up. When I turned the light on, there it was. A bright yellow sticky note on the center of my computer monitor. I leaned over the railing of the deck as our ship approached the infected coral. Even from at the height of the research vessel, I could see the blazing red algae cling to the reef like a parasitic blanket. The color was a mix of rust and blood. It stretched its limb lazily in the tide, consuming the marine ecosystem. Even the salt water smelled strange here. The ocean spray that drizzled on my cheek had an odor more like foul vinegar. We'd gotten several reports of wildlife acting strange in the area, most notably the dolphins in particular. Their usual playful nature had turned aggressive. People down the coast were being attacked by them like never before. A man had even caught video evidence of a pod slamming their bodies against the hull of a cruise ship like battering rams until their brains ruptured from the repeated impact. No one had seen anything like it. I wasn't sure of the exact science behind the terrifying change in behaviors, but I knew for sure it had something to do with the invasive algae. We were here to study it, to find its nature of origin, and most importantly, to eradicate it. Hey Ben, that's an ugly son of a bitch, wouldn't you say? Kyle, the master diver, called from the bow. Oh yeah, she's ugly for sure, looks angry, I replied. Making everything else angry too, it seems. Reminds me of my ex-wife, he chuckled. I don't know anything that could be as bad as Sheila, I laughed. Isn't that the truth? Give me five and I'll be ready to collect your sample. Kyle scrambled to throw on his suit and diving gear as I checked over my notes. I was betting on the algae carrying some microorganisms that infected the brain, inflaming the amygdala. But I needed some samples to study back at the lab to be sure. All right, preparing to dive. Captain, waiting on your approval, sir. Kyle sat on the edge of the railing, ready to submerge. I gazed up at the quartermaster. The broad shoulders of Captain Erickson engulfed the young lad from behind. He reached out a massive fist and gave the thumbs up. Kyle returned the gesture and situated his goggles, then flipped backwards over the railing and into the surf. The dive should have been textbook, 10 minutes in the deep and then out just enough to fit a few samples in a sandwich bag, carved out from his dive knife, then a quick ascension before spilling out onto the deck. But it had been half an hour, with no communication from his mouthpiece. The captain had even come down to the deck to pace the stern. He should be up by now, I thought, chipping an indention on the clipboard with my thumbnail. Finally, there was a cry that crackled over the walkie relay system. We all sprinted to the port side, desperate to locate the diver. There was a blue expanse as far as I could see with a hint of red death, but no Kyle. I started to panic. What if he got tangled up? What if he's trapped on the reef? I was about to grab my own diving gear to follow in after him before the cook, Jeremy shouted. There he is, right over there, look! We followed his finger pointing off to the right side of the reef. Yellow oxygen tanks bobbed over the surface of the water, but he wasn't moving. The captain signaled for man overboard operations and the entire crew scrambled to recover the diver. 
The quartermaster reversed the vessel as we readied the nets and pulleys. Once we were close to Kyle, a crane extended over the deck and dropped the net into the dark waters. We shifted our course to the left and drug the net until the diver was scooped inside. The gears began to churn as he was lifted out of the water and dropped back onto the ship. He fell with a thud like a heap of mackerel on the trusses. The men quickly uncovered him from the netting and tore off his diving gear. He wasn't breathing. Pierre, the medic, started chest compressions. The entire crew fell silent as he pressed his palms on Kyle's chest in a rhythm before lowering his mouth to breathe into his lungs. I feared the worst after no reaction from Kyle after four minutes of this. Had he died from such a simple dive? It seemed so unbelievable. He was a Navy diver that had undergone wartime operations after all. Suddenly, he spat water from his mouth and was overcome with a coughing fit as he expelled the ocean from his lungs. We all circled around him, and as soon as he came to, we all broke out in a cheer. What the hell happened? Captain Erickson silenced the celebration. I, I don't know. Kyle replied as confused as anyone else. Try, Captain Erickson demanded. I was swimming towards the reef when the algae seemed to, well, it seemed to swarm me. It was as if it were alive, a mind of its own. It wrapped around me and slammed me against the coral. His eyes stared off into the sky as he explained. Impossible, I whispered. Did you get the sample? Erickson asked. Yes, I got it. He held out a baggie of water. A red hunk of algae swirled around inside the plastic barrier as if it were trying to escape. Good. The captain snatched it from his hand and tossed it to me. I caught the bag and watched as it swam inside. Algae shouldn't behave this way. It's unlike anything I'd ever seen. That enough for you to study, Doc? His large beard twitched in agitation as his stern gaze met mine. Yeah, yes, sir. That should be plenty, I replied. Good, everybody back to business as usual. Let's get the hell out of here and back to the port. The captain sauntered back to his quarters as we all took back to our positions and turned the research vessel around. It was a four hour trip back to St. Medina's Marine Research Laboratory and the sun was beginning to set. I placed the sample in a secure chest until we reached the port. The crimson tendril swimming this way and that way was too unsettling. I didn't want to hold it any longer. I ripped open a bag of chips for a snack just before a red strobing light spun in my cabin. All hands on deck, all hands on deck. A robotic voice repeated over the intercom. I rolled off my bunk and threw on a t-shirt before storming through the hull of the ship. It had only been an hour since the dive. What on earth was going on? As I ascended the stairs, I heard screaming. Shrill cries for help reverberated through the steel passageway. What in God's name? I murmured as I crested the deck. Jeremy, the cook, lay spread on the deck. He was eviscerated. His bowels gathered in a heap at his ankles as blood pooled in a pond around his skull. Bile rose in my throat as I fought the urge to vomit. I reached down to check his pulse with my fingers on his throat. Nothing, he was dead. I pushed the tears away from my face and rushed towards the quartermaster. I could hear cries for help from below in the living quarters as I ascended the steps to the helm. When I burst through the threshold, I saw two hands still gripping the wheel. They were torn from their roots. Stephen, the quartermaster, sat crumpled in the corner, his forearms a bloody ruin. His abdomen was hollowed out like a butchered calf. A cavern of meat and bone sat empty where organs and tissue used to remain. His eyes were rolled into the back of his head as if he were trying not to see what was happening to him. The whites bulged in their sockets as veins streaked across them. As I was just about to scurry back down the stairs, the captain rushed up them. He barreled through the passageway and slammed the hatch behind him, nearly knocking me from my feet. Captain, what the hell is going on? I cried. Kyle, he's, he's gone mad. It was the first time I'd ever seen the captain show fear. He was normally so stoic projecting strength and confidence. It was extremely unsettling to see him this way. What do you mean he's gone mad? I asked. He wrapped thick fingers around my chin and turned my face to look out the glass over the deck. Kyle, the master diver, was hunched over in the moonlight, tearing meat from bone from the poor cook. Blood spurted from the body as he tore into the corpse like a hyena. Oh my God, 
I whispered. I spun around and watched as the captain rifled through a drawer. It has to be the algae. It must have invaded his brain, just like with the dolphins. What are we going to do? For once in my life, I was at a loss with no plan of action. We're going to kill him. Captain Erickson pulled a large revolver from the desk and spun the cylinder before cocking back the hammer. Okay, what can I do? You're the bait. He grinned at me as my heart sank into my stomach. Kyle had left his meal of the cook's blade across the wooden boards and vanished somewhere below. The screaming had stopped, but I didn't think that was a good sign. I think that meant everyone was already dead and there was no one left to scream. I slapped the soles of my boots across the hardwood and began to whistle. It was the Marine Corps anthem that my grandfather had taught me as a child. I paced the bow, stomping wildly as patriotism escaped my lips as loudly as I could muster. I was almost done with the song before I heard Kyle scurry up the steel steps. He spilled out onto the deck and paused, staring at me hungrily. His eyes were bloodshot and a red fungus had erupted through the pores of his skin. The algae had taken over and done the same thing to him that it was doing to the marine wildlife. Hey buddy, you good? I asked shakily. He just snarled and chomped his teeth together like a wild beast. The crowns of his molar snapped as he lowered himself to all fours and arched his back, preparing to bounce. Come on, Kyle, we're friends, remember? We both hate your ex-wife, I called out, but it was of no use. Kyle was gone, only a monster remained, one consumed by the Red Death. He rolled back on his heels before leaping through the air like a jungle cat. I folded my arms over my head as he soared towards me. There was no way I'd be quick enough to evade the attack. Just as he was about to collide with me, two shots rang out from the other side of the deck. The bullet struck Kyle from the side, causing him to falter and fall to the deck with a loud smack. He screeched and began to drag himself across the ship's surface despite two large craters in his side. Captain Erickson strolled to his side and placed a large boot on his neck. Kyle chomped at his soul violently before the captain lowered the revolver to hover an inch above his forehead. I'm so sorry, lad, he whispered before pulling the trigger multiple times, turning the master diver's head into a canoe of mush. We both stood at the side of our old friend for a while. I was numb, numb from what had happened, almost as if I were in shock and denial. Finally, the captain broke away to lean against the railing. He peered into the sky of stars for a long while before turning to face me. You still have the sample? He asked. Y yes I stuttered. Good. Then these men won't die in vain. He turned back to face the endless ocean. I didn't know why the algae had caused such violence, how it was even possible, but I promised myself, for the sake of Kyle and the rest of the crew, that I would find out. And when I did, I'd be back to destroy it. The Red Death would die. It would never do this again. Not if I had anything to say about it. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe and smash that like button to get notified every time I upload a new video. You can also check out some more of my animated horror stories right here.